To promote my new flower shop, I had one place print my business cards, another print my brochures, and a third, my signs. Now my roses aren't red, my violets aren't blue, my geraniums look dead, and I don't know what to do. Staples can help your business stand out with signs, banners, and brochures that are a true reflection of your company. And now at Staples, spend $50 or more on print and marketing services and get $5 off your next in-store purchase. Now my business is blossoming and I'm spending less green. Exclusions apply. In-store only. And 623-18. The Financial Crisis. What Happened and Why? By Yaron Brook. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the conference. I, uh, I was thinking of calling this class um, Financial Crisis for Dummies, but I thought some of you might take it the wrong way, so uh, <laughs> you would have signed up right away. Well, you're here anyway, so we're, we're good. We're good. <laughs> so uh, this really is supposed to be kind of an, an introductory session. Um, you know, we're going to talk about some, what I think are some pretty complex financial ideas or economic principles, but I'm really going to try to keep it at a level that might be uh, below some of you here who have a lot of knowledge of economics. Uh, so uh, be patient with me, and I'd be, I'll be happy to, to answer questions uh, as they come up. Um, but we're gonna, I'm going to try to pitch this at a level that is for the layman, for somebody who hasn't read much economics, doesn't know much about economics, and uh, we'll, we'll, build it up. Uh, we'll build it up from there. Um, I'm also not going to, uh, this, the, this course is not meant to be a discussion of uh, why capitalism didn't fail, okay? So I'm not here to say um, capitalism didn't fail, free markets didn't fail, because to me, and I think to this audience, that should be pretty obvious. I actually think that that should be an obvious point for anybody who's got eyes and, and can look out there into the world. If, if we believe capitalism is true free markets, it's, it's a system in which the government does one thing and one thing only, protect individual rights, in which uh, the government has, very, has really no role in economic behavior other than protecting property rights, then we didn't have capitalism, so certainly capitalism couldn't have failed. And even if you take a more moderate view of free markets, you know, the... the, the, the uh, the government, for the most part, leaves markets alone and only intervenes selectively. And uh, we don't even have that. We don't even have this moderate form of free markets, particularly in the industries that we're going to talk about. And we're going to get into more of the details. But just think about housing, mortgage business, and banking. We're talking about the most regulated businesses in the country. We're talking about businesses that are heavily, heavily regulated from zoning, land use requirements, and so on, on the housing side, to, you know, uh, entities that exist by government fiat to help set interest rates on mortgages and so on, to the very existence of the Federal Reserve, to, you know, to the fact that banks, every aspect of a bank is regulated from the day it started. Right? You start, try starting a bank, something I know a little bit about. Uh, you start a bank, the, the number of agencies, you need to get permission, you're... You're, it's the only industry in which when you start the business, you have to have the regulators approve your projections, your business plan. Every number in the business plan is reviewed by the FDIC and typically by state regulator if you're going to be state chartered or by a federal regulator, by the Fed, Federal Reserve, if you're going to be federally chartered. Every type of loan, you know, as a type, almost every aspect of the banking business is heavily regulated. So... You know, this isn't a defense of capitalism or free market. This is really a class where we're going to try to understand, at I think a pretty deep fundamental level, what actually happened. What are the main causes of this crisis? Um, there are other sources out there that are really good about, about this. I, I strongly recommend John Allison's talk that's on the web uh, on the financial crisis. I also recommend a book... Um, by, uh, called Meltdown by, his name is, -dum, Thomas Woods. I don't recommend anything else Thomas Woods has written, um, but I do that. And then I also recommend The Housing Boom and Bust by Thomas Sowell, uh, which I think deals with, the, with one, one, very, one aspect of the crisis really, really well. It doesn't really, have, it doesn't really tell the whole story. It tells the story of one portion of the crisis. So 
Uh, the, the other person I would, I would strongly recommend in terms of reading is, um, is Lawrence uh, White, W-H-I-T-E, uh, who, uh, who you, can, you can find his stuff on, uh, on Cato, Cato's website, and he's, he's just been hired by George Mason. He's a, I used to read him as grad school. He's a, he's a banking expert. Uh, he's a, particularly on, on free banking. He is one of the, probably the best guy in the world today uh, on those issues. So I, I strongly recommend uh, Larry Lawrence Wright's uh, work on this. Okay. Um, the crisis. Uh, you know, I don't have to... I don't think I have to say much about what we're facing. It, in, in many respects, it touches every one of us, every one of you, uh, whether you've got a 401k, whether you've got money in the market in some other form, whether you've been laid off, as, as millions and millions and millions of Americans have been uh, in recent months uh, and years, um, you know, whether, whether you're watching your home price, uh, the, the, the value of the home that you live in uh, plummet, uh, this is a crisis that really has hit Americans hard. It's hit, uh, it's, it's wiped out trillions of dollars of wealth we thought we had. We'll talk a little bit about whether we should have thought we had that wealth to begin with, but wealth we certainly thought we had, both on the real estate market, in the stock market, uh, and really in almost every financial markets. This is also a crisis that is not just in the U.S., I remember in the early part of the crisis, there were many commentators that were saying the rest of the world would somehow be immune to this, they will be free of this. But indeed, if you look at emerging markets, if you look at China, certainly if you look at Europe, even more if you look at the U.K., um, this is a crisis that is kind of spread across the globe, is impacting almost every country out there, and it having devastating impacts on many of those countries. Uh, uh, countries. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say this is the worst financial crisis we've seen in the United States since the Great Depression, and it and it ain't over yet. Uh, so, but but even even if it starts even if we start seeing some kind of a recovery soon, this will probably still go down as a longer. So, we'll talk about what I think is going to happen uh, and why I think we're, we're, we're far. There's still a long road. There's still a long, very very hard road. Uh, in front of us, that this is this crisis is not going to go away uh, quickly, and it's not going to go away easily, uh, and we're going to see we're going to see a lot more pain as we move forward. Like most financial economic events, there's a lot going on. Uh, a crisis of this magnitude doesn't happen because one thing goes wrong, because one thing gets distorted in the economy. This is not Freddie or Fanny, you know, and that's it. It just, you know, you just nail those two agencies and, you know, you can explain the whole thing. They have a lot of moving parts. I, we will spend today focused really on what I think is the most important of those moving parts, which is the Federal Reserve but, and monetary policy. But there are a lot of moving parts here. There are a lot of causes. There are a lot of reasons all integrating that bring about this particular crisis. And we'll try to move through them. I will focus on three areas during, uh, during the next three days. Not a day on each, because we'll spend more than a day on, 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 on the Federal Reserve and on interest rates and what, what happens. Uh, we will spend, uh, we'll spend time on the Federal Reserve and interest rates, trying to understand um, the business cycle. Uh, in particular, you know, I've come to, to believe, uh, strongly uh, believe in the, uh, that the Austrians have it right, the Austrian business cycle theory, developed originally by Ludwig von Mises and by Friedrich Hayek. Uh, Hayek did probably most of the work in it, and, and, and I think that was the source of the Nobel Prize he won in uh, 19, I think it was 74. Um, and, and further developed by Austrians today, by Austrian economists uh, today, uh, working at George Mason and, and other places. So uh, we'll talk a lot about the Austrian business cycle theory and how that works here. This particular crisis is manifested itself most powerfully in, in the housing market. So we will talk about housing. Uh, that's number two. We will talk about housing policy, government, government housing policy. We'll talk about the role Freddie and Fannie played, community reinvestment, and a whole slew of other you know, uh, incentives, tax incentives. Taxes play a huge role here uh, in terms of housing, uh, and we'll, we'll look at what kind of incentives taxes play. And taxes, taxing Tax policy has changed uh, over time with regard to housing, and uh, very few people have noted that really this last, the beginning of this last spike of housing uh, 
you know, was affected by tax change in 1997, where, where houses, capital gains on houses basically went away for up to half a million dollars. You could, you could make money uh, tax-free, which was the only asset you could do that in. Um, you, you couldn't do that in stocks, which, you know, if you provide people with an asset that they can invest in tax-free, what happens? People invest in it. <laughs> They'd rather not invest where they're going to pay taxes. Um, and then the third, part, the third part of this crisis, trying to understand this crisis, we're going to look at the financial markets. We're going to look at uh, what it means to securitize mortgages. We're going to look at what mortgage-backed securities really are. Uh, we're going to look at collateralized debt obligations and what those are. And we'll even look at you know, one of the, uh, what the media has often claimed is one of the real culprits to this crisis, which are the um, uh, CDSs, uh, credit default swaps. It's the, I have to keep the CDs on the CDOs and the CDSs. They stand for completely different things. And it, the credit default swaps, and I, I think that after, the, after our third class, you will know what a credit default swap is, what it does, and what role, if any, it played in what was going on. And, and we'll talk about why is it that financial markets g got so messed up. And they did. There's no question. Huge mistakes were made. The question is, why did those mistakes get made? And, and we'll kind of, I'll, I'll review those. And, um, you know, some of that is in, is, you can see in your ha uh, handout, we'll talk about the, the too big to fail doctrine. We'll talk about the, the rating agencies. And, and we'll even talk about, without actually talking about them, we'll talk about, in general, about kind of mathematical models as they are used in, uh, in, uh, in finance. Okay? We'll try to tie it all together towards the end, and I'll also give you my, um, uh, with, the, with the caveat that mac macroeconomic projection is a fool's game, I will make my macroeconomic projections <laughs> in spite of that, uh, with all those caveats that basically I have no clue, but all, all I can really say is things ain't getting better anytime soon. Oh, well, they'll get better, but they're not, you know, nothing, we're in for, we're in for a messy time. We're in for, you know, a five years, 10 years of a lot of volatility and a lot of bad stuff. Periods of good, you know, just a lot of ups and downs. That, that's my, uh, and how it exactly manifests itself, who knows? Who knows? Okay, so that's kind of the, uh, the plan for the next three days, for the next four some hours. Um, feel free to jump in with questions. Now, I'm gonna have to repeat the questions because we're taping. But feel free to just raise your hand, and uh, I won't, I'll, I'll sometimes ignore it if I'm coming on a roll on a particular thought, but I promise to get to you uh, if you're persistent uh, with your hand up. I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. If I ask if everybody understands something and nobody raises their hand, I'll assume you really understand it. Uh, last class, a few days ago, I asked if everybody knew if everybody understood something and everybody pretended that they did and <laughs> afterwards the rumor was that nobody really did. So uh, <laughs> I had to repeat it, but that's only because somebody told me what the rumor was. So please, you know, let me know because, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, the financial jargon is often easy for me. If the financial jargon is not clear to you guys, let me know. I don't want to, you know, the whole point again is... Um, an introductory course, uh, the financial crisis for dummies, so, you know, just act that way for that purpose. Okay? Any questions before we go on? Where we're heading, what we're doing? Okay. Good. Um, I want to start us off with a discussion of interest rates. I think this is interest rates... Uh, at the heart, at the key of what's going on today and what has gone on today. And I want to make sure we all understand what interest rates mean. So what, what are interest rates? What is an interest rate? Many of my questions are not hypothetical. Yes? <laughs> it's money that you pay for the privilege of borrowing money. It's money that you pay for the privilege of borrowing money. Okay, so it's a price, right? It's a price for the credit. It's a price you pay to be able to borrow money. How does that price, or what does that price reflect? What determines, in your mind, how much you're willing to pay to borrow money? 
What is going to determine, what are going to be the factors that say what, what the interest you're willing to pay on a loan somebody is going to give you? Inflation rate. Okay, so, so in order to determine the inflation is one. What else is going to determine? Yeah. The term of the loan, the length of the loan, the term. What else? Yeah. What you can earn with the money. How much okay, so what other opportunities you have? And we'll talk about the fact that those opportunities are really going to be determined by the other things as well. The, the, the lender needs to make a profit. Yeah, so the lender is going to, on his side, he wants to make a profit on the loan. Okay? Uh, so he wants to try to make a profit. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's in our opportunity. What else? Yeah. Okay, risk of default. It's interesting because you still haven't hit the number one determinant of interest rates, particularly in a in a free market where there's no inflation. Security. Security. That's risk of default. So that's 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 risk. Yeah, time preference. Think of a hundred bucks that you have in your pocket. The two things you could do with that hundred bucks, basically, right? You could spend it, you go buy lots of ice cream, right? And eat ice cream and get the satisfaction from the ice cream right now. Or you could save it, invest it, put it away for a certain period of time. Now, there's enormous value in consuming it right now. You get pleasure, you get satisfaction out of that consumption. So if you're going to give it up that consumption, if you're going to put the money into a saving account, or if you're going to put the money into an investment, what has to be the case? You've got to get something for it in order to be willing to delay that comp, you know, the, 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 the fact that you could consume it right now. You know. So, you know, I could consume $100 worth of ice cream today. I'm willing, which is a lot of ice cream. And I need to come up with better examples than ice cream. Ice cream obviously is uh, too, uh, too, much, uh, too much gluttony. Um, well, how about this? We, I could buy an iPhone now, right? iPhone, the cheap iPhone now is $99. I could buy an iPhone now. I'm a young uh, college kid. I could buy an iPhone now. How much would you be willing to give me for me to delay buying the iPhone? You know, I could delay it for a year. But I want something for that delay because there's huge value in me being able to buy it right now. Now, if you're a young college kid and you have the 100 bucks and you really want that iPhone, the interest rate might be really, really high, the, the compensation for you to delay it, right? If it's ice cream, 100 bucks of ice cream, ugh, I, I'm willing to do that for very little. I'm willing to delay the, 100, the, the, the eating ice cream. But the iPhone, you know, you know where my preferences are. You can see I've got my iPhone right here. Um, so we really have a choice when we have money in our hands of whether to consume it or to save it. And what determines, what determines uh, you know, whether we choose to consume it or save are the alternatives that we face. How much we need a particular good right now. What our future prospects. In the context of our entire lives, what is the best allocation? And part of that, an important part of that, is the extent to which we think long term, to which we are willing to postpone consumption. So imagine a three-year-old, you gave, or a five-year-old, you gave the hundred bucks to a five-year-old, they could go into a toy shop and buy whatever they wanted. What do you think it would take you to convince that five-year-old to put the money into the bank and save it? <laughs> There's no way you're ever going to do it, right? Because a five-year-old can think about now, maybe tomorrow, and maybe a week from now, maybe. But they certainly can't think in terms of years. They don't have the capacity to think in terms of years. They, all they're about, if they have money, is consume now. Now, 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 now. That's all they can mentally, you know, uh, physiologically probably think about. Indeed, in cultures in which we are now, 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 saving rates are very, very low. We'll talk about the, saving, the negative saving rate in the United States over the last few years. Um, cultures in which, and I would argue are more rational, to think longer term, 
that pursue long-term values, where individuals are thinking long-term and, think, and pursuing long-term values, are cultures that save more. Because they don't just value the fact that they have the $100 now, they value the fact that they can get $105 a year from now. And that $105, and then if, you, if it keeps growing, if it stays in the saving accounts, it could grow, and they're thinking about retirement, and they're thinking about that bigger house they would like to have, and they're thinking like the nice automobile that they would nice to have, or the kids going to college, or whatever it is, they, they have a preference for saving. Okay. They have this preference to delay their consumption. And I think as we grow, you know, as we grow from five to 20-something, we develop that time preference. We can now think in terms of long term. We can think in terms of what our plans for consuming the money is later. And we can resist the temptation, the emotion of wanting to buy it right now, at least some adults can, and hold that off in order to save in the future. And if you aggregate that over an economy, if you aggregate those saving decisions over economy, that's really where you get economic growth from. It's really where you get innovation, technology, because think about a, 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 a society in which we all got our paychecks and went out and spent everything on consumer goods that we then ate or, or dressed up in and were gone. Where would the venture capital come from to invest in, in new technologies? Where would any kind of long-term project, infrastructure project, any kind of long-term project, where would the funds for that come from? All the money we would spend on the ice cream, we'd go to the ice cream manufacturer, who would then build maybe more ice cream facilities, and then he would himself consume, right? Because everybody in the culture has got the shrimp term mentality. It would go nowhere. You would have no economic growth. Indeed, ultimately, you would have economic shrinkage. Saving is where economic growth comes from. That long-term perspective is where economic growth comes from. The ability to invest, to save, and therefore invest for the long term comes from our willingness to think about the long term. Okay? Make sense? So time and our time preference here is crucial. And this is an individual. It's crucial as an individual. But in a sense, it's crucial as, culture, as a culture because, as, as an economy, because we're aggregating those individuals. So if I have a strong preference for the future, if I have a strong inclination to save, everything else held constant, how would that change interest rates? Would they go up or would they go down? They would go down. The stronger my preference for the future, the less I'm willing to be compensated in order to wait for the future. So in a, in a place where we're saving a lot and thinking about the long term, interest rates are lower than otherwise. Okay. Again, this is a, in a free market. This is where we all are making these decisions free of any intervention. Now, we're going to assume when we talk about interest rates for now, we can add these complexities later. Let's assume that inflation doesn't exist, that we're not, we're not projecting inflation. And for simplicity, let's assume there's no default risk, just to make things easy. So we're really talking about primarily how the trade-off between consumption and between saving. Okay? So that's kind of our... Supply, right? That's our willingness to save. You know, the, the price that we're... But what, what do we know about prices? They're set by what? Supply, supply and demand. So actually, this is, uh, this is a demand... This is the uh, supply. This reflects the supply of loanable funds. This is the amount of money that's out there. But what's going to determine the interest rate? Yeah, so there has to be a demand now. And there's a demand out there for loanable funds, for loans. People are borrowing money. They might be borrowing money for consumption. And again, in a society which is focused primarily on consumption, that's where a lot of the borrowing happens. It happens in consumption. But they might be borrowing money for long-term projects, to invest in plants and manufacturing. They might be borrowing money to... Pay payroll. I mean, there's a lot of borrowing going on. And the demand for that depends on the entrepreneurs, on the opportunities the, opportunity, the, the entrepreneur sees, on the profit opportunities, on the type of investments. 
that are out there. Okay. So we've got a supply and demand that is basically going to set an interest rate in a free market. And that interest rate reflects, in aggregate, our preferences about time, about consumption, about savings. And that interest rate is incredibly important. Now, why is it so important? Why is it so important? Why are interest rates in an economy so important? What is it about interest rates? Yeah, Evan. Well, they not only determine the cost of borrowing money, but they enter into the calculation of the present value of any investment, any security. So they are a way of translating future expected cash flows into present value for any project that um, materializes over time, which means virtually every project. Yeah, so this interest rate, this in a sense is called a risk-free interest rate. The Austrians call it the natural interest rate. You can also call it, the, in finance, we call it the real interest rate. This interest rate that is determined by the supply and demand for loanable funds, independent of any intervention in a, in a truly free market, that interest rate, then, when, I want, when I'm investing in a risky venture, I add a risk premium to it. Right? And then I figure out, is this venture worth the investment? And we do something called, this is, this is actually the, I asked people if they knew what discounting to present value meant. And this is what everybody said, yes, they knew. And it turned out that they were lying. So we call this in finance present value. What we do is, is uh, I, I tell you you're going to get $105 from me a year from now. How much are you willing to give me for that? What's it worth to you today? What's $105 a year from now worth to you today? So the present value is what it's worth to you today, present, is going to equal to the future value, the 105, divided by 1 plus i. And I'm not going to go to into how we get to that, pretty, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. If you think about putting $100 into the bank at 5% interest, $100 times 1.05 gives you 105. So if you want the 105 brought back, you know, it's just, it's just the same formula massaged. Right? I. I is the interest rate. Interest rate. What's that? If, if we're talking about more than one year, then there'll be a to the end, assuming it's just one it's just one product. The idea here is that any future promise, any future cash flow that I receive, I want to know what's it worth today. And this, a formula like this, it gets more complicated if there are various cash flows. The formula like this is what it's worth to me today. That's what the present value of that is. And you can see that that is incredibly sensitive to I. Right? So if I'm talking about a 30-year mortgage, payments over 30 years, what is it worth today? Well, this I plays a huge factor in it. If I'm talking about investing in a, in a power plant that's going to take five years to build, so I'm putting money into it for five years, and then I'm going to get money out of it, how do I figure out if that's a worthwhile investment? I have to look at all the money I put in in today's terms, all the money I'll get in today's terms. If that number's positive, I do it. It's a profitable. If it's negative, I don't do it. That's called... Net present value analysis, net NPV, net present value. The present value of what I get minus the present value of what I invest. Pretty straightforward. Okay, all in today's dollars because you can't compare today's dollars with tomorrow's dollars, not because of inflation, but because I could, it goes back to the opportunities issue, I could have invested it in the bank. So I want to compare it against other opportunities that I have and therefore I use, I use an interest rate. What this basically tells us is that every long-term decision is affected by interest rates. Every financial long-term decision, whether to get married or not, is not influenced by interest rates, I think. <laughs> Wasn't in my case. I don't know about some of you. Okay? But every financial decision, every economic decision, you could even argue that ultimately every single Thing that we have around us that is produced is affected by interest rates. Because somebody had to invest in manufacturing equipment to build these tables. They had to take a loan, they had to raise capital for that. To do that, 
they had to pay a return on that investment. That return relates to this interest rate. Because a stock, when you buy a stock, you require a certain return on that stock. That return is ultimately a function of this interest rate. So the interest rates in our economy are crucial to every economic decision. This is a price that affects almost every other price. In many ways, and this is why the financial industry is so important, in many ways this is at the heart of what, of the economy. So, how interest rates are set, where they're set, how they're determined is crucial. Why, what it is that they reflect about us is really, really crucial because so many people make evaluations. So if I look out there and I see interest rates being low, what does that tell me about people's preferences? As a businessman, I'm a businessman. I'm trying to figure out you know, where I want to make investments, what I want to do. I look out. I see interest rates really, really low. That tells me people are long-term. People are not concerned about consumption right now. They're concerned about the long-term. And therefore, where am I going to make my investments? I'm going to make them long-term. That's where the money is, right? They're going to consume in five years. They're, not, they're relatively not interested in consumption right now. Interest rates are reflecting that about the people out there in the marketplace. Okay? When interest rates are very high, I'm going to make investments in consumption goods. I'm going to put investments into processes, into places that are close to the consumer because high interest rates suggest that people are going to consume now that they're less interested about the future, they're more interested in the right now. As, an inv- as a saver, if I see low interest rates, you know, independent of everything else, is that an inducement for me to save or not? No. no. It's low interest rates. Right? High interest rates are inducement. And note that, that the interest rate that we get in a free market is an equilibrium where everybody sees these inducements, where to invest, how to invest, and the interest rate gets set as an equilibrium between all these different incentives. Okay? So we have supply and demand. That's our, uh, this is our interest rate. Okay? This is the quantity of, uh, of money supplied. In terms of the supply of loanable funds, you know, as the interest rates goes up, I'm willing to supply more funds. And this is the demand for loanable funds. Okay? So this is what would happen in a, in a free market, kind of naturally, right? just because we're buy, buying, saving, borrowing, lending, investing, all of that economic activity gets aggregated through an interest rate. Okay. Now imagine a world in which we could arbitrarily set the interest rates any way we wanted, independent of supply and demand. Imagine a world in which I said, you know, I don't like this interest rate. Let's say this interest rate is 4%. I don't like this interest rate at 4%. Too high for whatever reason. And I am going to put the interest rate right here. I'm going, to, I'm going to make the interest rate 1%. What happens? So at 1%, yeah. Too many people one too few loanable funds. Now, one of the ways I can do this, one of the ways I get to this point, yes, that would happen, and there'd be a shortage, right, of loanable funds. But I have a secret way of doing this in which I can just print up loanable funds. Right? Has nothing to do with production, and has nothing to do with wealth creation, and has nothing to do with actual work out there. I can just create the extra loanable funds for people to have. So we'll never get into a a situation where people actually want to to borrow money and they can't because there'll always be 
enough supply. I will provide that supply. I'm borrowing money from banks. What's that? I'm borrowing money You're borrowing money, right? Now why? Because it's, it's cheap, right? Now what are you going to do with that money? You've, you've borrowed the money. What are you going to do with it? Well, you're going to consume, right? Because it's so cheap. Yeah, so why, what kind of investments are going to look like they're profitable because the money's so cheap but don't really reflect the reality of what people really want? Right? Because the reality of what people really want is up here. It's at 4%. But I've now artificially brought it down to 1%. Now, what happens when interest rates are really, really low? What kind of investments, put aside the consumption side, just in terms of investment, what kind of investments suddenly look appealing? Long-term investments. Because the longer term, go back to this equation. The longer the N, the bigger the N, the more impact I has on the present value. The longer the N, the bigger this number is, the sharper that declines. So if I have a, an interest rate that's really, really low, it impacts long-term investments much more than it does short-term. Think about the 105, right? If, if it's 105 a year from now, I discount it over one year, it's 100. 105 over 10 years, I discount it to today. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's 80 something. It's well less than 100, right? If I increase the interest rate, if I decrease the interest rate, so I make the interest rate lower than 5%, which is what we were using, it's going to have less impact on the one year because I only discounted it one year. It only gets to apply once. If I do it over five years, it gets to apply five, and therefore it has much bigger impact. So it makes long-term investments much more appealing. Okay. What other type of investments does it affect? So long-term, it biases us towards long-term. And what's the second thing it biases us towards? Risky yeah, risky investments. Because if you remember, the risky investments are this I that we originally had plus a risk premium. Right? I'm investing in at the real rates, at this natural rate, plus something that reflects that risk. And let's say the I is, we said it's 1% right now, and the risk preference, let's say that's 4%. So I, I need 4% to be compensated. The more risk you take on, the more you want to be compensated for the risk, right? Because there's a risk. You might not get anything in return. That's how risk works, by the way. Right? Sometimes bad things happen. That's what <laughs> risk kind of means. Some people forgot that in the last few years. Um, so my required rate of return, the rate of return I would require in order to make this investment would be 5%. But when interest rates are 4%, which is the real, real rate of return, my required rate of return would have been 8%. So an investment that let's say an investment generates 6%, this investment generates 6%, then in this scenario, do I make the investment or not? No, I require 8, it's only making 6. I say no, that's not a profitable investment, I'm not going to make it. Do I make it here? Yes. Now in a sense, if you, will, if you translate it to cost of capital, my cost of capital is 4% and I can get 6, I've made money. So some risky, not all, some risky investment that wouldn't make sense under a, the real natural rate of interest now seem appealing under this artificial rate of interest. Okay? Yeah. Magically or arbitrarily set the 1% interest rate, but the 4% risk premium is still... This is a market rate, yeah. Decided. Yeah, the market is, well, we'll talk about what freely means, but relatively freely decided out there. And, and that's not going to change because of the 1%, although there is a relationship between the two. It's very complicated. And, and it, you know, most people are not going to change it. It's going to stay that. So suddenly, risky investments become profitable. So when we lower the interest rates, 
we get long-term risky investments. That's where the money tends to flow, if you had this artificially low interest rates. That's on the one side. On the other side, I'm a consumer. I'm just one of us. And I was quite willing to save some money at 4%, right? I mean, that's where the equilibrium was, at 4%. Interest rates now are 1%. What are you going to save? How much are you going to save? Less, hugely less, right? I mean, at 1%, who wants to save any money? So what do you do with it? Since the alternative is save or consume, what do you do with it? You consume. You buy stuff. So when interest rates are artificially low, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, but when interest rates, how that happens in the real world, when interest rates are artificially low, two things happen. We consume a lot, and the investors who can get their hands on the money invest long-term and in risky investments. Those are the two behaviors. Now, what happens if interest rates are too high, if artificially I raise it to 6%? Well, the opposite, right? Do I want to save? Yeah. <laughs> I want to save more, because at 4%, I was willing to save quite a bit, right, to get this equilibrium. Now, I'm willing to save a lot more at 6%. The investors want to invest long-term? No, they want to invest short-term. Right, because at six percent, it drives away the long-term investments because those are worth less because interest rates have gone up, and they want to invest short-term. So they're investing in consumption goods, which is short-term type investments. But I don't want to consume. When interest rates are too low, I want to consume, and they're investing in long-term goods. You see how both scenarios create malinvestment, misallocations of capital, going in opposite directions. In equilibrium, I want to consume. And they want to invest appropriately. I want to consume some. I want to save some. They invest some in consumption. They invest some in long term. The incentives are aligned. That's the whole idea of an equilibrium, of, of, a, of a real interest rate, of supply and demand meeting. But when it's a misalignment, the interest rates refl don't reflect what we really want. They reflect something artificial, and we adjust our wants to that. So when interest rates are really low, we consume and we invest long term. Complete misalignment. When interest rates are too high, we save, but the investors, investors investing as if we're consuming. You can see how when interest rates are misaligned, you get massive malinvestment, bad investment. Investment in the wrong things, misallocation of capital. Okay. Questions? That's a lot. <laughs> yes? You're, I'm assuming you're looking at this uh, saving and investment as being pure savings in an inflation-free scenario where I'm either sticking it in the mattress or I'm putting it in um, some form that isn't actually translated it over into investment. Because my impression has always been that savings, ultimately speaking, if I'm putting it in a bank or something like that, ends up being translated into Investment. Yeah, no, I'm assuming, all, every time I say saving, I'm assuming that that translates into investment, right? But the people making the decision on how to invest are different than the people making the decision about saving. So I decide to save, but then what the person who takes that saving and invests it does with it, so I'm assuming you're putting it in the bank. Think of it that way. I'm assuming you're giving it to the bank, and they're giving you a certain return on that, and then the bank is then lending it out, so they're investing the money. Okay, so I'm... Yes, some of us do both. We save and we directly invest, but which makes it the same, really. It doesn't really matter because it's still, we save in a way that reflects the, in the investment incentives that are created here. Okay. The real, yeah, Sean. Sure. Is the misalignment of the supply and demand, I mean, the only way to make up for that, it seems to me, is by inflating the money supply because otherwise it would. We'll, we'll get to that. Yes, exactly. We print money, right? But no, let me get to that. Remind me, uh, I have to talk about inflation and what inflation means and then, and then why, why inflating the money supply doesn't necessarily mean price inflation. It means primarily misallocation of resources that sometimes can be price inflation. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Prior to the crisis, became, becoming a parent, 
There was a lot of criticism in the media and whatever of Americans being consumer oriented, spending, not saving. I mean, it's like a personality yeah. defect or cultural yeah. defect of immediate gratification and, you know, just yeah. rationality, basically. Yeah. You know, comment on that? Yeah, so this idea that there have been commentary really for a decade, over a decade, uh, you know, probably since the 1980s, that we are consumer culture. All we care about is consumption. We're short term. We want to consume, 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 consume. We don't think about the long term. And I'd say that's absolutely right, given the incentives provided to us by the interest rates that have been out. So I'm going to make the case, which, which I, I think is, uh, I'm going to make the case, which I think is true, uh, but which is a little tricky to make, that we've had two bubbles that are basically the same and that are fed off of each other and that are continuations. So we're not really just talking about a housing bubble right now. We never really overcame the dot-com bubble. We haven't really recovered yet from the dot-com bubble. There's this one sequence of, of mistakes that the Federal Reserve has made, and that's who sets those arbitrary interest rates, that has led to two bubbles. And, I, you know, and I'll just put up this graph because I think it's cool, well, depressing and cool. But just, you know, it gives, just gives an uh, illustration of that because of how dramatic these things are. You know, this is the S&P 500. Um, you know, I think, I think our problem started somewhere here. Oh, really, our problem started in 1914. But uh, in modern times, that's where our problem is. So, th- so, so, yes, I think we've been a consumer-oriented culture at least since the, the late 80s because interest rates have been held artificially low relative to where our time preference would be in a free market, and therefore we have consumed because savings didn't make sense for us. And I think that's... I talked about long-term investments. What's more long-term than Internet, than the venture capital, than all the capital that went in there? Now, I'm not saying the entire internet phenomenon is a bubble, but that, again, as we'll talk about, bubbles tend to piggy bank off of trends that are already happening. Bubbles tend to piggy bank, tend to explode, tend to build on an tr- existing trend. There's clearly real value being created here somewhere, and the bubble takes it completely out of proportion. There certainly was a real, there were reasons why Real estate prices, home real estate prices were increasing. It had nothing to do with interest rates, as I'll talk about. We'll talk about that in housing policy and so on, that the bubble latches onto and blows up. But yes, I think Americans have consumed too much, and I've got a slide here at some point we'll talk about, where you'll see that in the, in the period where interest rates were the lowest, Americans had negative saving rates. So they were clearly borrowing more than they, could, more than they were putting away as, a, as an economy in total. And indeed, Asians in Asia, in Southeast Asia, have really positive saving rates because I think they are at a point in uh, their, their cultural cycle and in terms of where they are, where they've come from and where they're heading, that they are very long-term. They think long-term. They're focused on long-term. And while they're consuming more than they ever used to because they've created wealth, they are thinking about the long-term in a more substantial way than we are. But... Again, this isn't necessarily a cultural reflection of who we are. It's about the incentives that we've been provided with. It's about what people in, at the Federal Reserve, in government, have wanted us to do. This is the kind of incentive that they provided us. So let's, let's talk about how we get these artificially low and high interest rates. We'll talk about why they're set and, uh, and what the implications are for, for, for markets. Because the, the implications are, these are two implications. The implications I gave about the misallocations is just one of many, many implications uh, here. So how do we get this lower interest rate? Well, the Federal Reserve basically dictates interest rates. At the, at the low end, Fed funds rates are dictated by the Federal Reserve. This is the loan. This is the rate in which banks lend and borrow money from each other. Okay. Now, how do they manifest that? How do they... Because this is just guidance, right? They just tell the banks, this is the rate we want you to lend and borrow. But there's no penalty if you lend and borrow at a different rate. The way they manipulate that price to be where it needs to be is by increasing or decreasing the money supply. It is by buying or selling securities in the open market. That's one way. Another way, they can change the bank reserves, which they rarely do, but... 
We'll talk about bank reserves in a little while, but, but uh, they can do that. But the primary way is by buying or selling securities and therefore increasing the amount of money in the economy or decreasing the amount of money in the economy. Okay. Now, so when they increase the amount of money in the economy, in a sense, they've told banks, they've told the world interest rates should be 1%, and we're providing the supply of loanable funds for all those people who want to buy it. Buy. Buying securities in the open markets, taking these bonds out of the market. I saw it. And, and therefore, you know, there's liquidity in the market. There's more cash in the market. Yes, question. So security, is that just money? Or? What is security? So securities are, are bonds, basically loans. So let's say I'm a bank and I, hold in my, in my, I need to hold some uh, safe uh, assets. Uh, so what I do is I, I buy government bonds. These are bonds that the government issues to raise money in order to fund their operations. Okay? So these are loans to the government. What the Fed does is it buys those bonds from me, the bank, and by doing that, increases the money that I now have on deposit. Right? I have now cash instead of pieces of paper. And that cash can then get circulated out into the, into the economy. Okay? And if you think about how money, money circulates into an economy, you know, we have in the United States something called Fractional reserve banking. Actually, every banking system in the world has fractional reserve banking. And everybody, every bank has had fractional reserve banking since almost the beginning of banking. So it's, it's, this is not something new. Um, there are aspects of it that are new. But, and this is, let's say this is the assets and the liabilities of a bank. When you go and deposit money at a bank, let's say you deposit $100 in the bank, the bank has a $100 liability. It owes you $100, right? It's a liability to the bank. Now, what the bank does is it takes that $100 and it lends some of that money out. Now, in the United States, regulators say that you can lend out of every $100 in a pure checking account, pure, pure checking account, you can lend out $90. So $90 are lent, $10 are held in cash. This is just an example, right? And... and that's in a pure checking account, it's 90-10. If, if it's other types of accounts where you have checking, it could go down to three. And in some accounts, like saving accounts, it's zero. You don't need any reserve. Okay? So the 10 is the reserve, the 90 is lent out. Now, what happens to this 90 I lent out? I'm a bank, I've lent you $90. What do you do with the $90? You put it in your bank, right? So somebody else, some other bank, I need a bigger whiteboard. There's a $90 deposit. And this bank now can lend out 81 and it keeps nine, right? And this goes on and on and on and on, theoretically, right? So every time you increase by $100 the supply of money, you actually, if it's in the banking system like this, you create potentially up to $900, okay? It's kind of you know, magic, but it's simple math, okay? Now, in a free banking era with no Federal Reserve and no reserve requirements, no regulations, so pre Pre-FDR, pre-1930s banks in the United States, this part of the banking wasn't regulated. There were other things that were regulated. Um, they were primarily regulated by the states. There was no federal regulation of banking. There was no Federal Reserve pre-1914. So pre-1914, what did banks do? Well, there were all kinds of banks. Some banks, if you gave them $100 into a checking account, kept the entire $100 in cash. And the way they made money was that money you put in in a saving account, let's say a five-year saving account, they'd lend out to somebody for five years, so they would match. So if all their customers came to the bank on the same day and demanded their money, the bank could give it all back to them. There were some banks like that, very few. The, some banks, and this again is a minority, lent out 40%, uh, 60% and kept 40 So there was a requirement was 40%. Most banks were somewhere in between, between 40 and 100, in terms of reserve requirements. No bank, no bank in America under free banking with no Federal Reserve lent 90%. Because it doesn't take many people to come and demand their money, and the bank is gone because it can't pay them back. It's lent all the money out. Now, why isn't it a concern for us? Since the Great Depression, we don't care. We're never going to run to the bank and demand our money. Why is that? 
we have deposit insurance. The government has basically said, don't worry, be happy. No matter which bank you give your money to, no matter how risky the bank is, no matter how irresponsible they are with your money, we will always pay you back what you deposited into your account. During the SNL crisis in the 80s, the Wall Street Journal used to publicize a little, a little box where they used to have the highest paying CD rates in the country. And in those days, it was 15 16%. And you could send your money to a little bank in Louisiana and get 16% return on the money. And people do that. They sent lots of money to these banks. That little table was a predictor, almost perfect predictor, of which banks were going to go bankrupt. Seriously. People have done studies on this. Why is that? As you approach bankruptcy, you're more desperate for money. You will need to pay more for it. And what do you do with the money? If, I, if I'm raising money from you at 15%, what do I need to get as a return on my investment? Much more than 15%. So how do you get more than 15%? Really, really risky investment. So basically what they were doing is buying lottery tickets. You know, real estate lottery and oil exploration lottery and things like that. But they were buying the equivalent of lottery tickets. And, but why, in a real market, in a rational free market, what would happen? I would say, I'm not going to give those, those losers my money, even at 15%, because the risk is enormous. 15% reflects the risk, and I'm not, I'm not willing to do that. So they would have got very little money, and they would have faded into the background. The SNL crisis still would have happened. It would have been very small. But at 15%, guaranteed by the U.S. federal government, I'm willing to give them all my money. And I get my 15% back because it's guaranteed by the U.S. federal government. That's, how the, that's the SNL crisis. That's why it was so big. It could have been a small crisis. It became a big crisis because of deposit insurance. Because we kept funneling money into the worst banks. And, of course, the SNLs that won the lottery were the ones that survived, and the SNLs that lost on the lottery are the ones that lost. It's, it's and, of course, what kind of bank, what kind of people does an industry playing that game attract? Gamblers, shady people, right? And that's why you got so many crooks all at once in the SNLs. They weren't long-term bankers. These were people who entered the industry relatively new. Charles, what's his name, uh, Keating and the rest of them, they were relatively new players. And why were they attracted? Because it was free money, government guaranteed, which they could play the lottery with. And you don't get real businessmen doing that. That's not fun. You get, you get the shadier type of people going into that industry. And that's why there's so many crooks all at once in the SNL industry versus any other industry. Very similar to mortgage banking, as we'll see. Uh, why you got shadier characters moving into mortgage banking. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. I need a smartphone with an awesome camera. Got anything to fit a new dad's budget? Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. And now you can get $50 off on select phones $99 and up. My relatives won't miss a thing. Now you can focus on the important stuff, like diaper duty. Discover the Total Wireless Stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in L.A. Limited time offer in 63018. Available while supplies last. Port and require for a non-track phone brand. Offer only available at Total Wireless Stores. Visit store for details. Yeah. Just to confirm what you're saying, there, there was an interesting graph in The Economist uh, several months ago, going back to the 19th century, the capital ratio of banks in the United States. And in the 19th century, it was almost something like 50%, you know, capital. Uh, tier one, equivalent of tier one capital. Whereas now, you know, in, by, the 20, by the end of the 20th century, it was like 5%. Yeah. So big banks in the 19th century had 50% capital in the free market with no regulation. No capital requirements, nothing. In our world today, with tons and tons of regulations and capital requirements and everything, you know, the better banks had 10 to 12 percent. The, particularly the money center banks in New York had closer to 5 percent. And the European banks had less than 5 percent. One of the reasons the European banks got hit is not so much because they had a real estate bubble or anything like that, but their capital requirements were so low in Europe that they didn't have to get hit badly on the asset side to get killed on kind of as a net worth on the net worth side. Well, again, we'll talk about how leverage works and why that is. But the more leverage you have, the riskier your position is, right? The more you finance a project. Think of your home. If you finance your home 100% equity, 100% cash, right? So let's say it's a million-dollar home. You pay a million bucks. I'm from California, so a million bucks is like buys you a little home. See, a million bucks, you buy a home, and let's say the value of the home drops by 20%. How much have you lost? 
200,000 is a percentage of your investment. How much have you lost? 20%, right? Let's say instead of that, you bought the house with 80% equity and 20% debt. I mean, I'm sorry, 80% debt, 20% equity. So you put down 200,000 and you borrowed 800,000. And now the house drops 20%. You've lost 200,000. What kind of return on your investment did you get? 100% negative return, right? You lost everything. Right? Now let's say you put 100% down, 100% debt. Notice the first two scenarios, there was no cash outlay. You lost your 200,000, it's gone. But you don't have to actually pay anything. Now, you bought the million dollar house with a million dollar mortgage and the price went down 200,000. Now you owe more, right, than what the house is worth. So now you literally, if you want to pay off the debt, you literally have to take another 200,000 from your wallet and pay it off or walk away from the home, which is what bankruptcy laws allows us to do, which is part of, a, a big part of the foreclosure. So leverage, the more debt you take on, the smaller the loss can be that will wipe you out. Okay. So leverage magnifies risk. So when capital ratios are 50%, which means very low leverage, banks can survive a lot of bad things. When leverage is 3%, 5%, it doesn't take much to wipe you out as a bank. And that's what happened to American banks and European banks. They got wiped out not because the losses were huge, but because they had no capital to back those losses up. Because they weren't required to. You know, this is, now, why is it that all the banks gravitate towards what the federal government wants them to do? So the federal government says that you can keep a 10% reserve. Why don't some banks keep a 50% reserve? Because if they don't, their competitors... Because if they don't, their competitors will, and there's no reward for being safer. Think about what happens in a free market. Let's say I'm a bank. Let's say I'm a bank that keeps 100% reserve. Every dollar you put into your checking account, I keep in cash, ready for you to withdraw. How much interest am I going to pay you as the banker? Probably zero, I might even charge you a fee to hold on to your money and, and to let you write checks, right? Let's say I'm a bank, again, in a free market. I've got, that's one alternative as a customer I can go, and I, I maybe have to pay a fee, but I'll get zero on my checking account. But let's say there's another bank in which they only keep half the money in reserve and half is gone. So there are possibility that one day I'll go and ask for my money back at the bank and it won't be there, at least not on that day. Ooh, is that riskier for me as a customer? Yes. So am I gonna, what am I going to demand in compensation for that? A higher interest rate. So I'm not against, there's some objectivists that have come out against fractional reserve banking. There's some Austrian economists that are against, I'm not. I'm saying let the market take care of it. Some banks will be high risk. Some banks will be low risk. And we as depositors, we as depositors will adjust our interest rates our interest rate, the demand that we make on interest rates accordingly. The high-risk banks will have to pay us a lot of money to get our money. The low-risk banks will, have, will pay only a low interest rate. With deposit insurance, that's gone. With deposit insurance, I don't care if you're risky or safe. I don't care what you do with the money. I don't care about anything because the government's got my back. Right? And you might say, well, there are wealthy people out there and theirs is not insured, right? Deposit insurance is only up to 250 right now. But there's some people who have $10 million, companies and so on. Well, this, if they're smart, what do they do? They, well, separate accounts is expensive. It's cumbersome. Put it in a big bank. Nobody has ever, since the Great Depression, nobody's ever lost a dime if they had a deposit at a big bank. And we'll talk about this the last day. It's called Too Big to Fail. <laughs> Too Big to Fail, which is an actual policy, was an actual policy of the Federal Reserve, which has proved itself true these days. Uh, the first example of that was continental Illinois in 1984, the largest failure of a, an American bank in history up until Washington Mutual recently. Every depositor was paid off in continental Illinois, every single one, including those who had tens of millions of dollars on deposit. It was too big to fail. Okay. So depositors don't have to worry about their money. Therefore, the banks, there's no competitive advantage to being safe. So what is there? There's a race to the bottom. Always is. And what is the bottom? The bottom is whatever the government sets the bottom to be. If the government set the reserve requirements as zero, there'd be a race to zero. 
So government intervention through deposit insurance makes banks riskier. Not to us depositors, because we don't care. It makes it riskier to us as taxpayers, taxpayers, because we're the ones who pay the deposit insurance once the fund is depleted, which it's on the verge of being any day now. Okay, so the point is that the Fed could put in a little bit of money and it has a huge impact because of fractional reserve banking. Money goes in. And they drive it, they put in enough money to drive it to the interest rate that they want. And one of the reasons they lower interest rates in increments of a quarter of a percent or half a percent, usually, it's pretty rare that they lower it in one percent, is because this is pretty delicate arts, if you will, buying and selling these things. To do it a whole one percent would be hard. Doing quarter percent, they can do it slowly, they can do it much more smoothly. They do a quarter percent every few months. They can increase the money supply slowly. They can monitor that they're not doing it too aggressively, too softly, that it's getting to the right place. And then they do the next round. And that's why you see interest rates going down, 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 down in steps. Because the Fed is fine-tuning their monetary policy as they go down. And it's hard. Let's be clear. Figuring out exactly what impact you're having by buying and selling securities on the market. But when you're increasing the money supply, you're buying, taking the security out of the market and putting in cash is hard. And indeed, it's so hard that they don't even have a measure of it. Uh, when you talk about money supply, there are five or six different measures of the money supply, the amount of money in the economy. Because think about it. Some money is in checking accounts. Some money is cash in your pocket. Some money is never going to be cash because all you're going to do is wire transfers. Some money is in saving accounts. Some money you might have overseas. Some people overseas might have dollars over here. The Chinese government has dollars over there. Um, there are all these different accounts. Some are checking accounts that have 90% reserve requirements. Others are types of saving accounts that only have 3.5% reserve requirements. Others don't have reserve requirements at all. It's complicated. So we have measures called M0, M1 you might have heard of, M2, M3. M3, the U.S. government doesn't report anymore. It doesn't tell us what M3 is anymore. They stopped doing that early 2006. The European Central Bank, though, uses M3 as their target. That's the most important number to them. The Federal Reserve doesn't even, doesn't even report it, doesn't even measure it. There's something called MZM. I mean, there are lots of them because every economist you speak to is using a different one because they're so complicated. It's so difficult to get a handle on what's going on because there's so many moving parts when you're trying to set monetary policy, when you're trying to set how much money is in the economy, measure that, that they can't even agree on one measure that is uniform. Okay, so we lower the interest rates to 1% by increasing the amount of money out there in the economy artificially, not as a result of anything real. Okay. We just print up the money, send it into the economy. Yes? I'm curious, have you seen the uh, calculation of M1 to M3 from John Williams' website? Do you agree with this um, I think I've got it. I think I've got M3 from him. That's it. So these are, these are measures. That's M3, because M1, M2, he accepts the government numbers, and M3 is calculated himself. I don't know. I, you know I'm, not, I'm not this kind of economist. I, I, don't, I don't delve into these. You know, he's the only one I know who calculated M3. You can see the government stopped reporting it right here, right in early 2006. They just stopped giving that number out. It's interesting what happens after they stop giving it out. I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theory guy, but it's just, you know, it's just curious, the trend afterwards. You will note, though, this: the the close to 10 percent increase in, in you know close to 10 percent increase in M1, which is the closest to actual money that is being released out there. So just just in terms of definitions, quickly, M1 is cash. You don't have to write this down. Cash, travels, checks, uh, checking accounts, and amount of money at the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve's float, it's called. M2 is M1 plus saving accounts. Money markets with no checking, small denomination time deposits, and retirement accounts. M3 is M2 plus large time deposits, time deposits are saving accounts. Euro dollars, uh, dollars in, um, in U.S. banks overseas, and institutional money accounts. So again, and then there's others. There's, I've seen MZM used, and M0 is, is, even, is even tighter. It's even more closely to actual money, actual cash. 
So the Federal Reserve increases money supply, lowers it. If it wants to increase interest rates, it sucks money out. It sells the security it bought before and maybe some additional securities, and money sucks out, money becomes in less supply, and you get a higher interest rate. Now, we've had a Federal Reserve that does this all the time, every day. Twelve guys get together once every two months. They sit around a table, and they say, we believe interest rates should be 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, whatever it is they decide that particular day. Why do they decide a particular interest rate? Well, they have a mandate. The mandate is to do two things. And this goes back to the act that installed Federal Reserve and then all its amendments over the years, but they basically have two. One is to minimize price inflation. doesn't say no price inflation, it just says you know, minimize it, reduce price inflation. So prices don't go up overall. Second, maximize employment. So you want to have fully employed population with no price inflation. That is what the Fed is there to do. And we know how important interest rates are. And the government knows that too. Everybody knows the interest rates are really, really, really important. So they try to manipulate interest rates to achieve no inflation, no price inflation, and high unemployment, and high, low unemployment, sorry, <laughs> low unemployment, high employment. Okay. And it's hard. <laughs> I actually argue it's impossible. But this is what they're trying to do. They've got very, you know, sophisticated formulas to calculate these things by. There's something called the Taylor Rule that takes some inflation and some unemployment and mixes them together and results at the end is an interest rate that you should be targeting in order to offset these two so you get some optimal level. The Fed generally is targeted somewhere around 2% as an acceptable inflation rate in terms of price inflation. And unemployment is, all, is fluctuated, but generally over the last 10 years, they try to target below 6% and actually below 5%. So, and if you look at how they've done, they've done really well. Inflation has not been very high, price inflation, and unemployment has been very, very low until this final crisis. And that's how they set monetary policy. They've got a, cal a formula, and it pumps out an interest rate. And you can actually take the Taylor Rule and, and plot it, and you'll see that the Fed most of the time is within a certain range of that Taylor Rule. Sometimes it deviates out of it a little bit, but generally this, they seem to be followed. Taylor is a economist at, I think, University of Chicago, they tend to follow that, that rule He's, over the last, at least during the Greenspan era. And the idea is this. During recessions, there's a lot of unemployment. That's not good. We want to minimize recessions. How do we do that? We lower interest rates significantly. We lower interest rate, gets people buying stuff, gets people investing in stuff. That, the economy recovers. Unemployment goes up because we don't like unemployment. The economy's, you know, heating up, right? You hear that term, the heating up. It's growing very, very fast. The risk is then that prices will go up. So we, reju we lower, I mean, we increase interest rates. And they keep increasing and decreasing and increasing and decreasing and increasing and decreasing. All in order to get into this little groove where they've smoothed out the business cycle. Okay. And this is Alan Greenspan's whole shtick during his period as head, of, head of, the, of the Federal Reserve, was to smooth out the business cycle. Okay. So, just as an example, uh, that's a same graph, similar graph. This one is Dow Jones Industrial. When uh, this happened, the recession after the dot-com hits, and then 9-11 happened, and we were heading towards recession, Alan Greenspan, wham, slashes interest rates to the lowest rate they've been in a very, very long time, basically 1%. Uh, we will see, you can see that right up here. This is the Fed funds rate. You can see, at, you know, they were going up, the bubble burst in the dot-com, interest rates collapse. That's the Federal Reserve lowering them. It's not interest rates in the real market collapsing. It's the Federal Reserve lowering them. They keep them at 1% for a year, which is historically unprecedented, and then they start raising them again. When you say until recently they've done a good job, how far 
Well, I'm sorry, I didn't say they'd done a good job. They followed this path. Yeah, what they've done was they've flogged their Yes, state. so during this period, I mean, since, the, since Alan Greenspan took over or since Volcker crushed inflation, I'd say since the early to mid, like the 83, 84, inflation's been relatively low, unemployment's been relatively low throughout that period and indeed declining. But what is, in, what is inflation? Inflation, they, there's a basket of goods that they measure the prices of those goods year in, year out. And they, you know, if those basket of goods is increasing, that's how, what they call inflation, CPI, consumer price inflation. And today they won't even look at all goods. There's something called core inflation. It's just a few goods. They exclude what? They exclude oil and they exclude food, right? Because we don't really consume food and oil, so they're not. <laughs> no, but they exclude them because they're volatile, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just kind of funny because what if they're volatile up? Is that not inflation? I mean, but it's not included in the, in the, in the way the Fed looks at inflation. The Fed looks at core inflation, which excludes those things. It certainly excludes the price of homes going up two, two and a half times, like they did in some regions. Excludes, it excludes the price of Internet stocks going up a thousand times in some cases during the dot-com bubble. Those aren't included. So, yeah, we've had stable inflation, stable unemployment, but we've had a pretty volatile time. If you look at the previous chart, right, at least in the last decade, we had a pretty volatile decade. Econom- economically, but, you know, as manifested in the stock prices. But the goal is eliminate those big dips, at least from an unemployment and inflation perspective. That's the goal. Now, notice what's going on here. Since we've had a Federal Reserve, since 1914, we have no idea what this is. We don't know what the natural rate of interest is. We don't know what the real rate is. There is no market, right? So we have no clue what people's true preferences in terms of consumption and saving are. All we know is what the Fed would like interest rates to be, and how we respond to what the Fed does. So it's not that I'm arguing that, ooh, the Fed misbehaved here because it lowered interest rates to 1%. I mean, we'll see why that's, that was really, really a bad thing, and that was a particularly dumb thing. But I'm saying the very existence of the Fed distorts the marketplace, no matter what they do, because they create a barrier between the marketplace, everybody in the marketplace, investors, savers, consumers, everybody, and what the interest rate really is. We don't know what supply and demand for loanable funds in a real market is. We know what the government would like it to be. We know how the government manipulates it, but we don't know what it really is. So we don't know whether Americans would consume what their ta- true time preference is. We don't know whether Americans would save more than the Chinese or less than the Chinese. We have no idea. Because all Americans are doing is responding to incentives created artificially for them by the Federal Reserve. And think about the fact that this affects every decision we make, every economic decision we make out there. Not only whether we consume or whether we save, but what kind of investments we make, whether they're short-term or long-term, risky or not risky. All of that is impacted by The Fed, by the Fed setting interest rates. And yes, accidentally, once in a while, it could set the interest rates right there. But even that doesn't mean anything. (laughs) Even that's not a real interest rate. Because by their very existence, they've distorted our incentives. What this makes it, the existence of the Federal Reserve, and this is why in the fight for capitalism, the Federal Reserve is enemy number one. (laughs) Because they impact Everything, every decision. So running a business, being a consumer, being a saver, being an investor, all done behind a fog. We don't really know what's out there. We kind of have a sense. But there's no reality that we're looking at because it's completely distorted by monetary policy. So... It shouldn't be any surprise that we have bubbles, we have crashes, we have a lot of other things that are distorting. It's surprising when things go well. And that's because the market, in spite of the fog, can somehow manage. 
were more short term than we would be otherwise? No question, particularly when interest rates are too low. But how do we know they're too low? What does too low mean? That would assume that we knew what the real interest rate should be. And this is lower than what it would be. But we don't know what the real interest rate should be. Now, we can tell that that's too low because that's below the rate of inflation. That's a negative real rate of return. We'll get to that in a minute. But what is too low? You know, what are interest rates? If, if a defender of the Fed were to say, well, as long as prices are stable, it must be doing a good job about inflation, is the criticism of that, how is, how is price stability mentioned? Because you pointed out that the current measure actually excludes critical components like housing prices. So I, I assume Greenspan would have said five or ten years ago, what are you talking about? Prices have been stable. What so the question is, a defender of the Fed would say something like, look, we've, as long as price, prices are stable, you know, everything's, we're doing a good job, you know, because that's, that's our main function is prices are stable. And look, uh, for the last 15 years, take two, three years back, prices have been stable, so we've done a good job. What more can you expect from monetary policy? Well, a lot. To begin with, why is price stability the standard? In, in a free market, it's not clear that prices are stable. They're probably rapidly declining. Not rapidly. They're probably somewhat declining, right? Things become cheaper. Look at your computer, right? Even with price inflation, it becomes cheaper all the time or higher quality all the time. Why wouldn't everything? Look at Why wouldn't housing decline, right? The technology to make houses improves all the time. We should be getting better and better houses for the same price. Why should prices ever go up? If there's more demand for housing because of immigration or because we have lots of kids, build more homes, plenty of land in this country, just look around. So it's not clear that price stability should be the standard. But secondly, and this is the more important point, what's important is not the level of prices. As, or let's say that is important, but that's not the only thing that's important. What's also important are the relative prices. Because what, is, what are the relative prices of tomatoes versus automobiles versus real estate versus something else? What do those reflect in a real free market? People's free voluntary preferences for those goods. So where they are is important. If everybody's, you know, everybody's buying tomatoes because of some government incentive to go and buy tomatoes, but the price level is the same... Because on average, something else has gone, but nobody really wants that many tomatoes. It's stupid. So it's silly, or in this case, everybody buying a home, everybody pricing a home way out of the stratosphere. We don't need those homes. We don't need to build all those homes. The fact that at the same time, price levels were stable is meaningless. When so much waste, so much misallocation is capital. So the point is, and this is the difference between the Austrians and the Friedman style monetarists. Milton Friedman and the monetarist school that particularly comes out of the University of Chicago believe, and I'm simplifying here, I know if you're an economist, this is simplification, believe that when the Fed increases the money supply, their money flows into all goods and all prices go up. So if you want 2%, if, 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 you, if the Fed achieves 2% increase, that means a certain increase in the money supply, but that's it. It just stays 2%, and that's okay. It's relatively stable. But that it goes, in a sense, equally into the economy. In some way, it impacts all prices. It might take a little bit of while, but not very long. Pretty quick. The Austrians say no. There's no reason to believe that. There's so many other things going on at the same time. Money could flow all into real estate. And prices were way up in real estate, and the rest of the prices might still be stable. You know, maybe some prices. So in that mis- what the Austrians emphasize are the relative prices. And what the Austrians emphasize is the misallocation of capital. Misallocated. We're building too many houses given real supply and demand. We're putting too much money into Internet stocks given their true nature. We're not putting enough money into who knows what. <laughs> You know, who knows what the market would be putting money into in a truly free market? I don't know. Nobody knows. That's the beauty of a market. Who knows where entrepreneurs would be 
making new discoveries, would be inventing new things, would be making investments. We don't know. But that's the importance of the Fed's distortion. And this is why, and I think this has, I, don't, I haven't figured out the full implications of this, but this has implications for mathematical, for, for, for some of the mathematical models that assume, you know, because I think a lot of the neoclassical economists coming out of Chicago assume that everything's mathematically modeled because it's all simple, right? Money gets in, prices go up, bam, you got a new equilibrium, everything stays normal. And therefore, everything, everything is modeled like that. Everything is easy. So you can even regulate, right? You can regulate, you can tinker with this, you can tinker with that because we can model everything. But reality is a thousand times messier than that. And therefore, it doesn't behave in those simple kind of patterns. So you can't observe the misallocations, obviously, or easily, like you would price increases. That's measurable. I can tell that pretty quickly. But a real estate bubble, that takes a while to figure out that it's happening and then figuring out when it's going to burst and when it's going to peak and all this stuff. That's hard. Messy. Yucky stuff. Can't model it mathematically. So we tend towards the simplification of the models. So the whole, I think the fact that the monarchs have dominated, the Friedman style, have dominated the free market school of economics has done free market a lot of harm. Because it's made the world believe that it's simple. And it's not. Okay? So the, the key here is this misallocation. Austrian economics says, and I think absolutely true, and I didn't believe this for a long time. I was a finance professor in finance. It's all pretty simple stuff. We're very influenced by Milton Friedman and the monetarists. All all finance professors believe in free market, but they believe in them from an economics perspective with a huge flaw in their thinking. And that's why they can't explain bubbles. They can't explain misallocations. They can't explain the irrationality of the market. It's not pure irrationality as much as it is these kind of distortions and fog that is created. So, yeah. so the interesting conclusion is even if one were of utmost integrity doing the absolute best one could, one could have been chairman of the Fed and the same disastrous result could have happened because there wouldn't have been a way of knowing how the relative misallocation of goes. I think that's right. So the question is, uh, you know, even if you were the best intentioned Federal Reserve chairman, you couldn't do it right. And that's absolutely true. You cannot run the Fed right. And, and Alan Greenspan knew this a long time ago, in the 60s, I think. There is no right way to run the Federal Reserve. I once uh, had this debate with a colleague, and I said, well, what if we do what Friedman said? We only increase the money supply 2 or 3% every year, but it's, it's a rule, and everybody knows it. Doesn't work. Won't get it right, because, again, that 3%, is right, wrong, too much, too little in terms, of, in terms of what the market demands, in terms of this interest rate, creates misallocations and perversions. What if we targeted gold? Well, but is gold really a market price for money, or is it a gold a market price for something else? What does it really mean? The, once you have a Federal Reserve, you're screwed, is the bottom line. There's no way to do a good job with the Federal Reserve. If you believe in markets, then it's markets. The Federal Reserve is not a market. The Federal Reserve is a government entity with a monopoly over interest rates, a monopoly over money. Yeah, Ted. Would there be a business cycle in a truly free market? Would there be a business cycle in a truly free market? I think there would be recessions in a truly free market. I don't think there would be a business cycle. Cycle implies a certain pattern to it. There would be no pattern. So, for example, imagine that you imagine a major new technology entered into the marketplace, something that was going to revolutionize all of our lives and had major implications for every other industry. You know, maybe the automobile industry, maybe technology. And as a consequence, massive amounts of restructuring needed to happen. Plants in the Midwest had to shut down because they couldn't compete anymore. Labor had to be retrained to work in this new technology. And it was so big, and it's really hard to imagine because I think these things would be rare and shallow. But you would have to have a period in which some companies went bankrupt and their employees got retrained in order to do these new jobs over here. So you'd have a shallow recession with some unemployment and then an an increase again. But it wouldn't be cyclical because those technology shocks are rare. I guess you could also have a monetary shock if if gold was your standard and there was suddenly a gold discovery somewhere that for a short period of time would distort Prices. I haven't really thought that one through, but I think that's another potential reason why that would happen. 
Now I am out of time. Thank you all. This course continues with lecture two. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. I need a smartphone with an awesome camera. Got anything to fit a new dad's budget? Don't worry, you got this with Total Wireless. And now you can get $50 off on select phones $99 and up. My relatives won't miss a thing. Now you can focus on the important stuff, like diaper duty. Discover the Total Wireless Stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in LA. Limited time offer in 63018. Available while supplies last. Porting required for a non track phone brand. Offer only available at Total Wireless Stores. Visit store for details. Little wireless stores 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 visit store for details. Little wireless stores.